Hello guys, good morning, don't be alarmed, I just have to do a bit of a sound check. Test, 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 ooh, louder. Test, 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 noise. Guys, I'll see you in about five minutes. Hello guys, wonderful good morning. Please join me. Hi. Hello guys, super nice that you that you join me at nine in the, in the, in the morning. I really appreciate it. We have uh, well, we have one of those days where I have only good news for you. Let's start. Um, number one. Let me explain. So you only see, of course, half of my job. What you see is me teaching. But you don't see that half of my job is doing research. So yesterday um, I presented my, my new paper, the paper I'm working on currently, at a conference in Belgium, online, but still. Because it was online, I was able to record everything. Uh, I have also checked with my co-authors if I may make the recording available to you. Everybody agreed, so I can make it available. It is on the YouTube channel, but not visible for you yet. However, I want to do this, if you want as well. And the reason why I want this is, well, there are several reasons. I want very, very good students to watch it. 
or let me start differently. I want students to watch it that are considering maybe a career in academia. So to do something basically for a living as, as, as what I'm doing. Because that is literally going to be your job then. Obviously, it makes sense to have a look how that looks. Secondly, I want, well, I'm in touch with quite a few of you about master selection, possibly finance master. If you are thinking to do any master, not just finance, any master, I would like that you watch it because the presentation I made yesterday uh, is very, very defense-like. Defenses are non-public events. That means it's very difficult for you before your own defense to see how this is going to go down. So of course there are descriptions and manuals, but nothing shows you how a real defense is, like actually seeing a defense. In your actual master thesis defense, you present 15 minutes, one five, 15 minutes, your research, and then you have Q&A about 40, 45 minutes, where two supervisors try to poke holes in your story, in your research, and you have to push back. So the conference uh, I attended yesterday was uh, uh, economic history, which is basically my field, or which is the field of my new paper. So that means the historians worldwide that, uh, you know, matter were there. I presented for about 25 minutes the paper, and I had to survive then 20 minutes of Q&A by real experts. So if you watch this, this gives a very fair representation of how a defense is. So if you are thinking of doing any master, check it out. And last but not least, I would like students to watch it that are very insecure in finance. Not, it's not about the content, but I suspect one of the reasons why you might be insecure in what we discuss is you come to class, you see me or you see Celine explain something ideally in a rather clear way. And when you watch me or Celine for two hours, you come away thinking, well, that's straightforward, that's rather logical, that makes sense. Yet you might know then the feeling the moment at home you open the book or the moment at home you open Connect, all of a sudden it feels different. It feels more difficult, it feels more challenging. So I can imagine it's very easy for a student who is maybe not a natural finance crack to come to the conclusion, when I'm in class watching Flora, Celine, everything seems easy. When I'm doing this as myself at home, it's very difficult. What's wrong with me? Am I too stupid? Am I... What's the problem? That is not the problem at all. The problem is that Celine and me, we are hardcore teachers. We never show up unprepared. I obsess every waking minute of how I can improve my explanations, my slides. That's literally what I'm all about. So when you watch us, you basically see people that are specialized in this kind of stuff for many, many years. Obviously, that looks a lot easier than when you do this. You do this for the first time. It's the first time you're exposed to this content. So I, I can tell you, and please believe me, you're holding up really well. So I want that you see me give a presentation and answer or try to answer questions from hardcore experts where the difference in level between these experts and me is at least as big as the difference between you and me in terms of routine in terms of knowledge. So I want that you see how it actually looks when I give a presentation and answer questions, not in an area where I'm super comfortable, but really in a field of research where I'm also new. It's research, it's original, it has not been done before. Obviously it's new, it's very new to me. And I want that you see how much I'm struggling with this. Uh, I want that you don't think I'm smarter than you. I'm not smarter than you anything. I'm very similar in that regard. So I would really like that you watch it and if for no other reason than to see Celine and me are, are by no means more advanced than you. We are maybe a bit more routine and a bit more experienced. But when I am exposed to new finance con um, content, I struggle at least as much as you. And I'm not embarrassed to show you. Actually, I spoke to my co-authors and they said it was a really good presentation and you held up really well about the questions. After my presentation, I don't mind admitting, I was super frustrated with myself. I thought, I've never done such a shitty presentation in my life. I felt really like a total idiot. So I thought, if you're an insecure student, and if you are starting to question your competency, your intellect, please don't watch the presentation. It has nothing to do with your exam at all. It's interesting, it's finance topic, it's about firm death, reasons why firms die. It is quite interesting, but it's beside the point. I want that you see 
that when I am exposed to new finance stuff, I struggle at least as much as you, okay? That's the first thing. If you want that I upload it, I don't want to drop it uh, like this. If you want that I upload it, just leave a comment on YouTube or something and I, I will do so. What else? I said I have only good news for you today. Good news item number two. On my agenda, on our agenda today is only finishing the chapter dividend policy. So I still need to explain, I still owe you an explanation on after our first lecture where I made a big fuss about it should not matter if firms pay dividends or how high the dividends or how low they are. I need to explain now why in the real world dividends do matter. F spoiler alert, we don't know it. So what I will do is I present a couple of explanation attempts. Uh, that is that. And last but not least, full disclosure, you could easily do this by yourself, click through the slides, you probably understand everything like this. But I can add value. What I've done is I've worked through the whole chapter, dividend policy, in third edition, it's chapter 18, and I created a mind map. So what I have done is I have tried to isolate every, every single content, um, uh, concept that pops up in chapter 18, mapped it out, and connected them to each other. It's a huge thing. I just want to show you very quickly what to expect. This is how that looks. This is the mind map of the whole chapter 18. So the reason why I want to show you that is, well, there are a couple of reasons. First of all, it will allow me to walk you through the whole chapter 18, not just name dropping, not just pointing out a couple of different concepts and then say, well, good luck with that. Figure out how they connected to each other by yourself. That allows me to really show you how every single term, you know, our crazy finance language terms, are connected to each other. So I'm sure after going through the mind map, chapter 18 will be crystal clear. But there's more to it. I want to show you what causes problems. This is now not a finance information, this is now school information. Why students sometimes struggle on the exam. Students study very different compared to how I create an exam. Uh, let me show you very briefly. Wait, I remove it. Let me show you briefly what students do and let me show you briefly what I do when I create an exam. So you open the book, I'm very sure, and you look at different concepts that pop up. You look up what does capital market mean. Uh, you probably look up um, what does catering theory of dividend mean. What does dividend signaling mean. And you study this very diligently and you can go to the exam feeling very well prepared. But I'm not going to ask you definitions like this. You can look this up in the book. You can Google this in three and a half seconds. I don't care for that. Obviously, you need to know it, but that's not what I'm going to ask you. I ask probably questions that have to do with the connections. So even if you study the book really well, I don't want to freak you out now, but I want to be honest. So I will ask questions that aim not at those blocks individually, but that aim at the connections between the blocks. So what I would like to do is, I would like to show you, in the, in the, uh, as an example, in chapter 18, dividend policy, how I think you should study. I think you should do something like this for every single chapter. And I don't mind telling you, students that do this themselves for every single chapter that score, will score a 9 or higher if they also practice our calculations, of course. But this is the perfect way to prepare for the theory part of the exam, the part that I create. Uh, as I've said in our Telegram group, please join if you have not joined. If you have not joined yet want to, go to announcements on Canvas, you find the link. Uh, I would, if I were a student, I would get organized. How many chapters do we have? Something like maybe 10? I would say, okay, there are, I, I form a couple of groups of students, 333, three, whatever. Each group works out a complete chapter, circulate it, the mind map that you create, circulate it, proofread it, be critical about it, and you should within, I don't know, a week, essentially have mapped out in exactly this way every single chapter. So, so I would never buy those scripts that are, you know, those, 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 um, those bootlegged scripts about corporate finance because they are... They are just explanations of random concepts and don't pay attention to the connections. This is the way to study. And because there are so many of you, there are, what, 1,800, 1,900 students enrolled in this course, you can crowdsource this in such a way that basically in five minutes you have this done. So this is, I think, the way to study. Uh, and the last thing I want to say about this is, every, when you connect everything, 
it's much easier to remember because that's how the human mind works. We, can, we are not very good at remembering random chunks of information, like random numbers, for example. You need to put them into, into relation to each other. You need to connect them because then the information is anchored in many spots in your mind, in your brain, and it's much easier to recall. So stuff like this, when you map it out in this way, you will never forget anymore, okay? So this is on the agenda. Oh, so, and the last, sorry, last piece of good news today will definitely finish earlier. So no reason to, to, to have, a, have a bad day. I would say we hop in before we do. Any questions that I can address? Anything finance related, anything whatever related. Anything I need to know about? Let me check the chat very briefly. It's nice. I like it that you say you wanna see, you wanna see the, the research, super. Like I said, drop a comment on YouTube and, 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 and I will deliver. All right, then let's hop into our actual content. Let me open my PowerPoint. Uh, PC. So, give me a second. So. Okay. Blup, blup, blup. All discussed, discussed, discussed. So, we stopped, or our first main conclusion was Modigliani Miller, Proposition 3. So what was Proposition 3 about and how is it called? Well, officially it's called Modigliani-Miller Proposition 3, also known as the Dividend Irrelevance Proposition. Irrelevant means, of course, it doesn't matter. You should not care. The core message of Proposition 3 is if, again, this is a big assumption, a big condition, if a firm's investment policy is fixed, firm's investment policy, what does this mean? Essentially, it means that the firm will not change its asset composition a lot. So meaning they are not engaging in any new positive net present value opportunities. So assuming everything else fixed, what will be the consequence? Number one, the magnitude of the payout does not impact the firm value. It does not matter in normal human language. This means it doesn't matter how much a company pays out in the form of dividends, this does not impact the value of the firm. That's uh, conclusion number one. Conclusion number two, the so this is magnitude. Conclusion number two is the form of the payout, doesn't matter if it's dividends or share repurchases, has no impact on the value either. So summing up proposition three, the irrelevance proposition in human language, I would say it states this. In perfect capital markets and assuming that the company is not engaged, engaging, will not engage in any new projects, we can conclude two things. It does not matter how much a company pays out and more. It doesn't even matter in what form a payout occurs. What do I mean with it doesn't matter? It does not matter for the firm value. It will not increase the value of the firm and it will not decrease the value of the firm. And we, of course, also discussed why that is. Why is that? It's very similar to what we have discussed with leverage. You as a shareholder would not care about any of this because in a Modigliani-Miller world, you could artificially create whatever amount of dividends you want. That's what we call homemade dividends. I have a brief side note here and I want to do this super officially and, and, and correctly. I said it uh, in our class on Monday, but I wanted to have it really with the red exam insert. I'm super patient with students, but I don't like it when students make mistakes that I point out a lot. So I really want to be on the record and saying this. On the exam, uh, not only would it break my heart, but I would punish this severely if you confuse homemade leverage and homemade dividends, okay? I told you honestly how that sometimes goes on the exam. I ask a question about homemade dividends and students write down a perfect description of homemade leverage. You will get zero points for this because there are very different concepts. They are both homemade in the sense that you as a shareholder can synthetically achieve any amount of leverage you want. In the context of dividends, you can achieve homemade synthetically, artificially, any dividend you want. So they share the, the idea of 
doing something yourself, not depending on the company, but yourself. That's why homemade. But leverage, so the, the mix, the proportion of debt to equity, is very obviously something completely different from dividends, okay? So I want that you make a note, almost like in Harry Potter, I must not confuse homemade dividends, the dividends with homemade leverage, okay? Do not confuse this. In my book, confusing homemade dividends and homemade leverage is an equally big sin as dropping the initial minus on a net present value calculations, okay? Don't do this. Homemade dividends is not the same as homemade leverage. And if you don't understand it, I'm perfectly fine with you asking me about it and I will explain it again every which way until I'm sure all of you understand it. I do not want to see a single mistake of that form on the exam because it is 100% avoidable, okay? Please make a note if you talk to other students that don't come to class. Please say, Flo said today, if you confuse this, you're in a world of trouble. Please quote me on this and refer them to the time code of this. I will also quote it on YouTube. Okay. Super. Honestly, on the record, is, it, is, is, is this really clear to everybody? The difference homemade leverage and homemade dividends. Perfect, guys. Okay. Okay. So we went and through an example. This was actually the evidence I tried to bring to the party to show you that Proposition 3 is not, uh, is not simply a, a statement I want you to believe in without evidence. I tried to provide evidence why Proposition 3 is meaningful. So we went through this example, working through th three different dividend policy, policies, sorry, paying out excess cash, uh, performing a share repurchase, and paying out dividends in an amount of more than what the company has available in excess cash. And we noticed, whoop, 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 let me go there. Where did we have our... We noticed that the share price would not be impacted Furthermore, we noticed it doesn't really matter what the company is doing because essentially the only thing changing is the timing. So you can have, if you want very high dividends in the future, observe policy two, you would have higher dividends in the future, but what is, I don't want to say the cost, what is the trade-off here? No dividends right now. If you say, well, I want very high dividends right now, you can have that. Have a look at policy three, very high dividends right now. What is the trade-off? The future dividends will be much lower as well. Last but not least, have a look at policy one. This is some sort of like a middle ground, medium high dividends now and medium high dividends later. So this is the trade-off that we are facing in, in, in the context of dividend policy. You can only rearrange, but no matter what the firm is doing, Nothing will make the shareholders better or worse off. It's just a difference in timing, really. Okay? The net effect is that the size of the dividend does not matter for the share price. This is the conclusion. We discussed homemade dividends, not to be confused with homemade leverage, exclamation mark. What is the essential idea of homemade dividends? Well, the idea, the core idea is that the dividend policy of the firm should not matter to you as investor. Because if you prefer, as a shareholder, a different timing of the dividends, so you want dividends maybe later or earlier than what the firm would provide, or if you want a different magnitude, more or less, then you can attain, achieve the desired timing or size of the dividends yourself by doing what we call homemade dividends. What are homemade dividends? It simply means buying or selling stock. You remember this underwhelming example I showed you uh, about an investor who owns a certain number of shares. The company pays out a dividend of only $2 per share and the, the investor wants more, twice as much, not two, but $4 per share. And then we looked into how could this be done via homemade dividends. And we said it's very simple. If the firm does not pay out any dividends, then, and you as an investor want more dividends, then just sell a part of the shares. How many? Well, however many shares you need to sell to reach the desired level of, I don't want to say dividends, but of cash inflow. Uh, so that was the one side of the homemade dividends. I remember from homemade leverage, many of you immediately then say, aha, okay, so this is how it works. If the firm pays out dividends of a magnitude that is not high enough, for the shareholder. But how would I do the opposite? 
how do I handle when, a share, uh, when the firm pays out more than what I actually as a shareholder want? So I have an example of course for that as well. Before we do the second example, I would like to go through a list with you of dividends, pros and cons. So based on the um, discoveries, statements, propositions of Modigli Modigliani and Miller, you must right now, I think at least, have, have the idea that, okay, that's kind of weird. He is telling us every which way that dividends don't matter. When you look at a newspaper, you see in the real world, clearly dividends matter a lot. So share prices typically go down the moment a firm announces that they will cut dividends. Share prices go up when a firm announces that they will increase dividend payments. So I would not blame you if currently you're thinking this is all the ivory tower of science. None of that has anything to do with the real world. So I, I feel I owe you an explanation why in the real world dividends matter and why it is not so easy to determine what firms should be doing. So I would like to go through a list of advantages of actual paying out dividends and disadvantages. From a theoretical perspective, paying out dividends in the form of cash is probably one of the worst things a firm can do. So we need to then really look into why are they doing it and why do shareholders actually like it? So let's look at the pros. Why are dividends appealing to shareholders in many situations at least? Well, there are many investors, shareholders of course in, in the context of dividends, that desire a stable cash flow but do not want to incur transaction costs from periodically selling shares of equity. What does this mean in human language? You might be a shareholder, you might hold a large portfolio of shares. Uh, you want to basically pay for your, for your living using dividend payments or at least a part of that. If you, your shares are shares of companies that never pay out dividends, you would say, well, it doesn't matter because flow explained, you can engage in homemade dividends anyway. So you just periodically sell off parts of your shares to create artificially, synthetically, well, homemade dividends. But with every single sale of shares, you incur transaction costs, meaning simply the bank says, for every share you sell, I want a fraction of basically the, the, the value of the transaction. Don't forget, when you look up, what are the assumptions that form the concept perfect capital markets? No transaction costs is one of the assumptions in Modigliani Miller world. That is not holding in the real world. So if you're a shareholder and you constantly engage in homemade dividends, you can, but the transaction costs will start to eat you up. So why would, the, uh, in some situations, investors prefer actual dividend payments rather than homemade dividends? Well, because if I, the firm, pay out cash dividends to you, you get the cash inflow that you desire, a stable cash flow, yet you do not incur transaction costs because you don't need to buy or sell anything. Number one. Number two. Number two is my favorite point and I don't mind admitting or telling you why. This is about investors with limited self-control, so I recognize my own personality here very much. It, it could be that you're similar to me. The moment I get my salary, I look at my bank account and think, ah, I'm filthy rich and I buy the most random crap. And then two weeks into the new month, I'm running out of money. I don't know. If you know this, then you can relate to point number two. Investors with limited self-control can meet their current consumption needs. That's just complicated language for they can get enough cash flow as they need by, by holding a portfolio of high dividend shares, so shares of firms that pay a lot of cash dividends, while adhering to a specific sort of investment policy, investment strategy, which is called never dipping into the principal. What that means is, if you have a lot of money, you put it on a bank account, uh, and the money will generate interest income for you. And you could say, my policy is, I only spend the money on the most random crap that I earn from the interest income. So that means the actual amount of money, which in finance is called principal amount, you never touch. So let's say you have 100 euro on your bank account, at an interest rate of whatever, 5%, you never touch the 100, you only spend the 5 euro interest income that you earn every year. So this here is a point that basically uh, argues that investors like me 
who don't have a lot of self-control would otherwise with homemade dividends run the risk of selling off too many shares and liquidating their portfolio essentially. Okay, so it's a bit of a behavioral argument. Number three, we are still talking about reasons, advantages of firms in the real world paying out dividends. Managers acting on the behalf of shareholders can pay out dividends in order to keep cash from bondholders. What does this mean in normal language? I'm the manager of the firm, you are a shareholder, maybe our firm is a little bit financially distressed, I as the manager, and that's a big advantage of dividends, I as the manager of the firm can, before we go bankrupt, take the excess cash or excess, the cash that is still available on our firm and pay it out to you guys, to my shareholders. At some point later we go bankrupt, the firm goes bankrupt, what is left in the firm available for the bondholders? Nothing. This is called bondholder expropriation. And I list it here as an advantage. Brief side question here. I'm showing you a list of advantages of dividend payments and I just presented a point. What do you think of that? I want to hear your opinion. There's no wrong answer. I just want to hear what you think about this. I just said the advantage of dividends, of paying out cash dividends in the real world is, can be used as a strategy, in the case of financial distress especially, to keep cash from bondholders. Don't be shy guys. What, 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 what's the first thought that comes through your mind when I say these things? Somebody's, oh wait, sorry, I'm sorry, I have, sorry, please say again, my computer was muted. Yes, go Jan. Okay, perfect. Uh, I, I, uh, I was thinking of maybe it might be illegal to, uh, uh, to keep the, the money away from bondholders, especially if the firm is, is, is expecting to, uh, to default. Excellent, Jan. So that's a very good argument. Um, but I, I, I want to actually take it even more seriously. So I don't know if you remember this, but we spoke about this specific point already before. We spoke about... Uh, in the context of increasing leverage about this, the point I'm presenting, uh, the reason why it's on my list, number one is, every corporate finance textbook would list it, as does ours. I cannot argue with the sort of logic of the point. Jan pointed out it might be illegal. He for sure has a point. But to the very least, I have to disclose that I'm deeply deeply uncomfortable saying this now to you, all of this, in the context of a pro, of an advantage, of a benefit of dividend payments. Regardless of the legal setup, regardless of Jan is right, completely or wrong, if it's legal or in, illegal in some countries, who cares? I find, that's my personal opinion, feel free to have a different one, I find this grossly unethical. Essentially, in human language, what this means here is, what, what, we're looking at a list of advantages of dividends. What is an advantage? You can use dividends to screw over bondholders in a very brutal, nasty, hard way. To the very least, I find it unethical. And Jan for sure has a point. It's very likely, of course, un illegal as well. So just on a sort of side note, I, I want that you understand that in finance, very often we come to conclusions that check out mathematically that might even check out um, legally, but don't forget that ethics are also extremely important, I think. Uh, I don't know what kind of manager, what kind of employee, what kind of, maybe more general, what kind of person you wanna be. I would hate, honestly, to be a manager that goes home, looks in the mirror and says, ha ha, today I screwed over bondholders in that way. I would never wanna be that kind of person. Like I said, feel free to have a different opinion, but don't forget that ethics matter, I think. Is it clear what I'm saying, guys? Can I add something to this? Of course, Philip, bring it. I believe that uh, when it comes to bondholders and, you know, and loans in general, it really depends on the, I think, ethic I've started. Because we can be fair and we can be ethic, but uh, I would, for example, uh, want that the other side also would be ethical and uh, see if I struggle and help me if I struggle and be reasonable about it and often banks and often bondholders are not that people and they are also not ethical when it comes to struggle.
choices. So it's really, I think, depends on the situation. Overall, I agree with you, Philip. I think you, you, you brought a very important, uh, you expressed a very important thought in, in philosophy and ethics, I mean, which is referred to as the golden rule. If you don't know how you should act in your whole life, then basically it's not stupid to apply what is called the golden rule. Do unto others as you want others to do unto you. Basically treat others like you want to be treated. I, want, I don't want to be screwed over in this way. And therefore, even without being a philosophy professor, I understand sort of almost intuitively that this is ethically wrong. Like I said, it's, it's fine if you have a different opinion. I hope you don't, honestly. I hope you don't. Um, what else? Well, the board of directors can use dividends to reduce cash available to spendthrift managers. I told you at the very beginning of the class, students very often study standalone concepts, but cannot or sometimes don't really connect them well enough. This is something that has popped up in a different context already. I've showed you a very similar list, even in a similar layout, pros and cons, advantages and disadvantages of debt financing. And one of the advantages of debt financing, if you remember, if you don't remember, go back to it. But one of the advantages was as a firm increases leverage, meaning takes on more debt, what else will go up? Well, the interest expense that this firm has to pay. What is the consequence of higher interest expenses? Well, less cash available in the company. How is this an advantage? Well, it is an advantage if the manager of the firm is some dude like me or maybe some dude like Trump who basically throws away cash, spends cash on random crap. That's what, what's meant here with spendthrift managers. So if a firm, if the shareholder uh, meeting decides, yes, let's pay our cash dividends, it means there's less, less cash available in the firm for a manager possibly like me to spend on whatever, comic books and old Nintendo games, let's say. Yeah? Um, I ju I'm just questioning the real world applicability in this case because, like, normally in big, in big companies, there's like always a board of directors, mm -hmm. and normally, like, managers also need to obey like a set of rules and spending rules and all that kind of stuff. So, normally, they are also regulated if not the banks are watching them. So, I'm just like wondering in what extent or what degree does it really apply that. If managers have too much cash, they're the bad boys and they're spending like all the firm's money on, I don't know, cars and all this kind of other stuff. Like yeah. Uh, I mean, that this is of course something that you would have to analyze in individual cases, uh, Michael. So, so I'm, I don't really want to argue with, with you about this because there are cl very clearly managers that act very ethically, that are zero spendthrift. And then we have of course people like, I mean, just look at the headlines over the last month the stuff that Elon Musk is doing, the stuff that Jeff Bezos... I mean, Jeff Bezos is running essentially an online shop. I mean, it's very big, but it is an online shop, let's face it. Yet, he has built a spaceship for, what, space tourists. So, I mean, oh, I think at this point we can all, all already drop the topic. So, I'm not saying every manager only has his or her own interests in mind. But that managers waste money, I mean, that is, I don't even want to say an open secret, that's really a fact. Again, there are, of course, large individual differences, but in general, that, so the list here I'm going through, that's not science abstract stuff, that are real life arguments, all of them. Okay? Um, last but not least, and this is a very important point, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark in your, in your notes, managers can use dividends to signal something. Remember, signaling is relevant in a situation of high information asymmetries. You as a shareholder don't know the same things about our firm as I the manager. I'm much more of an insider than you. So I as a manager need to send a credible signal to you. Not just any signal, a credible signal. A signal that you can believe. So I can increase the dividends to signal to you, my shareholders, my optimism, my positive outlook, outlook concerning future cash flows. So essentially my expectations about the future earnings. The reason why I can do this is once you increase as a firm dividends, it's very difficult to walk back. It's very difficult to decrease them without getting punished by shareholders. So you as a shareholder would think 
as you see me, the manager, increase the level of our dividend payments, you would as automatically assume, probably correctly, that this is a permanent increase and I'm not going to take it away from you anymore next year. So you would interpret it as a very positive signal for the future. Okay? And that is also, again, to connect a little bit to Michael's question from before, I cannot stress enough, this is all real-world stuff, and that you can really see in stock price developments, okay? That you can check this, and you should check this. There are, of course, also disadvantages, cons to dividend payments. Honestly, the third point here, managers acting on behalf of shareholders can pay out a cash dividend to, to keep cash from bondholders. You could very well also put on this side. I think. It is not here because mathematically, financially, it is an advantage and not a disadvantage, but it's certainly, I think, an ethical disadvantage. What are disadvantages of dividend payments, cash dividend payments? Dividends are taxed as ordinary income. So it's not like I give you money and you say, awesome, cash dividend 100, nice. They are brutally taxed. And there is something, I don't want to go into the details because it's far outside of my area of competence, tax law. I know some students are studying on the side tax law, so I want to drop it here. There's, a, I think, an interesting question hiding behind this. Where do dividend payments come from in terms of balance sheet logic? Well, we've discussed this in the accounting refresher. If a firm makes a profit at the end of the year, the profit is moved into the retained earnings. The retained earnings are building up, building up, building up. And if the firm pays out a dividend, it is paid straight out of the retained earnings. So the retained earnings go down by the amount of the dividend paid, right? Then I pay out the dividend to you and it is taxed as ordinary income. Okay, what is weird about this or what is screwed up if you think about it? The money, the profits that go in the company into the retained, in into the retained earnings has already been taxed. How does the income statement look like? Well, revenue minus expenses, bloop, 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 and we end up with a profit before tax. On this one number, we calculate the corporate tax. So then we have profit before tax minus corporate taxes equals net income, and that goes into the retained earnings. So with the first point, especially if you're interested in tax law or maybe a bit more philosophical questions, you can ask, is this a fair thing? that some streams of cash are taxed twice. The dividend payment that you get will be, when you pay your income tax, this will be the second time it's taxed. It has already been taxed before with a corporate tax rate, right? So, I, yeah? No need to apologize. Ask. Mm -hmm. But um, normally, or I can say in Germany, the dividend tax rate is 26%. Mm -hmm. So the dividend tax rate for personal income is like almost in all cases, especially like in Luxembourg mm -hmm. um, or in these kind of countries, it's way lower than the personal tax class mm -hmm. in which you're moving. So isn't it like beneficial for the stakeholders who are receiving the dividend payments? Sorry to interrupt. I need to interrupt. You're talking about shareholders, not stakeholders. Right? Uh, sure. Shareholders. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. Go on. Isn't it like more beneficial from the shareholder side to receive a dividend payment, which is taxed by 26% instead of a salary or a bonus or that kind of payment? Well, a shareholder doesn't receive a salary from the firm at all. A shareholder also does not re receive a bonus from the firm at all. No, but I mean like, for example, imagine that you have like your, your own startup and mm -hmm. you're paying yourself a salary of let's say like three or five thousand every month mm -hmm. and then you have the idea or you have to decide between well do I have mm -hmm. to increase actually my wage yeah. and pay even more taxes because I'm in the highest wage class mm -hmm. or tax class in this case mm -hmm. or do I just operate with my company and at the end of the year on the 31st of December mm -hmm. I'm deciding to pay out dividends because they're taxed less than the wage I'm, I'm receiving. I mean, this, we are then we are really not only touching upon tax law. I mean, in order to answer this, we would have to really dive very deeply into tax law, and it's very different in different countries. 
So in Austria also, I think in Germany, it's, it's, it's pretty much the same. What is taxed is your world income. So, so everything from all your income streams, from, from freelance work, from your salaries, from, from dividend income, all of this would be taxed together. So I, I would like to respond to your input in, in a, a little bit more general way. Dividends are not good at all under no circumstances in my view. If you want to save on taxes, what should the firm be doing, no matter if you are the, the manager or a normal shareholder, the firm, if they can afford it, should always buy back its own shares. Because if the firm buys back its own shares, you as a shareholder are much better off. Share price will go up, very likely. Uh, in the future, future earnings are divided over a lower number of shares outstanding, yet there are no taxes paid at all. So for you, dividends would always trigger tax payments, whereas increases in the share price never do. Not never, they would trigger uh, tax payments on your part when you at some point sell your shares. But to the very least, you can then determine the point in time when you sell your shares and then it would, it would trigger the tax payment. So you could say, I wait for a year where I have all kinds of other losses. Then I sell the shares that, because no dividend payments have ever occurred, have increased in share price. That would give you a profit. But based on most tax codes, you're allowed to net your losses with your profits and you end up with essentially very low tax payments. So that would be actually the best strategy in my view. Any cash payment should be avoided, I think. Yeah. Tax and this kind of dividend tax. What? So normally there's a difference, right? Yeah, of course. You're absolutely right. I think what is a good way to, to round um, up our, our conversation about this topic is what you're saying is the tax rates matter and you have a very, very big point. You're absolutely right. It matters how high is the corporate tax rate that is applied in the company. How high are you taxed just on this normal income stream. How high would you be taxed if you were to sell stocks and generate uh, essentially yeah, capital gains? So all these tax rates will differ from each other and you're right, for an investor it would make sense to basically calculate each scenario to see how it works best. Yeah, no question. And I mean to make it even more real life relevant, we could add, and again I find it very unethical, but I'm your finance teacher for now, not your ethics teacher, to, to, to respond directly to, to, to Michael's essentially question how to minimize tax payments. I mean, if that is your overriding uh, objective, your guiding objective, then you would probably set up some other company in a country like, I mean, Michael already mentioned Luxembourg. There are plenty of other countries, Cap Cayman or the Canal Islands, Jersey, Guernsey, you know, countries like this where there are officially tax rates of zero. So then you would set up a company there, have the company hold the, the, the shares in your name. Any dividend payment goes to the firm on the, let's say, Canal Islands, where there are no taxes. So that's also possible. If you're interested in these things, I'm a bit surprised because it's nine in the morning and we're talking about tax law. <sighs> but if you're interested in this, what you want to Google is the difference, well, just Google the term tax avoidance versus, you know, tax policy, essentially. So with these, all these conversations, you have to be very, very careful because the line between unethical and illegal is, you know, that's a very small step. But that's what you want to check out then, okay? Okay, no problem, of course. So dividends, we're still talking about disadvantages. Dividends, on the one hand, as an advantage, reduce the cash available in the firm for managers to waste. Yes, that's good. What is bad about it? Well, there's less cash in the company to be used as an internal source of financing. You might want to make a note here. This, this is chapter 18, but it connects to something we have discussed. This here, internal sources of financing, in the context of which theory have you heard that already? Theories we have discussed. One specific theory I want to hear. Taking the theory. Which one? You're absolutely right, Alice. Not something like that. Exactly that. Yes, be confident. You're absolutely right. Packing order theory. Packing order theory tells us how a firm should, uh, not how should, but how they finance their assets. 
And it turns out that very often they follow a packing order, like a specific order. Step one, ideally, managers will use internal funding. Step two, if no internal funding available, issue a debt instrument like a bond, so borrow money. And last resort, issue equity, shares. So if you reduce your internal sources, your, basically your cash, because you pay out dividends as a firm, you immediately cut into step one of the packing order uh, paradigm. Yeah? This is a very nice source of financing. If you pay out dividends, it might mean that you don't have enough internal sources of financing to pursue positive net present value opportunities. It's maybe not that big a deal because you can still attract external sources of financing like debt or equity, but internal sources are of course better because they are less costly. And last disadvantage, I already mentioned this several times, once you have established a certain magnitude of dividends, it is very, very hard to cut them down, to decrease them. Because that would be interpreted by shareholders as a very strong negative signal and you would get punished for it. Okay? So, if we look at this, there are plenty of advantages of paying out dividends, plenty of disadvantages. You've already seen what pops up often is are taxes, what pops up often is it's a good idea to keep money away from spendthrift managers. But keeping money away from them also means cutting into your internal sources of financing. So looking at this pro and con list, it's not easy to say, what should a firm now be doing? In the real world, I already told you, it's very obvious what they should do. Share buybacks are the best because no taxes have to be paid. If a firm can afford it, that is what should be done. Yeah, a couple of more inferences, a couple of conclusions more. Dividends are taxed at a higher rate than capital gains. Capital gains is complicated finance language for the following thing. You might buy a stock, a share for 100. The company is doing well. More people buy the stock and the stock price goes up to, let's say, 110. You still have the stock yourself in your pocket. The, the increase in price from the purchase price you paid, 100 to 110, that is called capital gain. What is the tax rate on capital gains? Zero. Because accounting-wise, this would be called unrealized holding gain. As long as you don't sell the stock, you know mathematically you have achieved a profit, but as long as you don't sell it, no actual cash flows and therefore no taxes have to be paid. So you can then determine when you want to sell the stock and that would trigger then the tax payment, the tax liability. So it gives the shareholders a lot of flexibility really. So can I have a question to this? Of course, Philip. Mm -hmm. And uh, after it, uh, you have to pay a tax on the profit you made. I, I would, I, I mean, we are now a little bit loose with the terminology. Accounting wise, when the stock increases in price, as long as you have not sold it, I would not call it profit. It's really called, it would be a gain, to be more specific, an unrealized holding gain. I would be reluctant to use the word profit without specifying more. Profits, when we use it sort of as a word, it implies taxes have already been paid. So a, more, a better term for now would be, I think, gains. But go on, sorry. No, no, that, that was just to clarify that, yeah, okay. Okay, cool. Now, yeah. Nice. I wanted to have a quick question. Shoot. Um, so when you're buying back shares as a company, it is normally a financing cash flow expense, right? But is it before tax or after tax? Don't call, no, I, 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 I don't want to say I take offense in the wording, but I need to jump in because this is really a, a, a teacher topic now. Don't say in the cash flow statement it is an expense. Expenses you find in the income statement, no, in the cash flow, monthly. it's a cash outflow. It, so it's a negative cash flow, yeah, basically. Yes. So my question is, is it before tax or after tax? I would have to look up in the, in the, in the code. I don't know. Cannot say from the top of my head. Absolutely, yeah. If you buy back your own shares, you logically take it out of your retained earnings. Uh, theoretically, you could also finance that by taking on debt. You could take a huge loan and the proceeds from the loan you could use to buy back shares. It's also possible, yeah, theoretically. Mm -hmm. Because if it were like before the tax, it would behave similarly like to debt financing, like paying interest because 
because it would be also an expense which is actually beneficial for your company before tax. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. Yeah, if David. Guys, I said at the beginning, the good news is we will probably finish early. I, 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 love, I love your questions, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying, please then don't, at the end of the class, don't say, well, he promised we end earlier and we're still here, all right? So that's, of course, our trade-off. Go. I promise, I, I no, 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 don't, don't, don't promise not to ask questions. That's literally the only reason I get out of bed, so it's fine. I'm just saying, then the trade-off will be we will not finish early, which is perfectly fine. You go, Jan. Capital gain tax is actually 16.5%. So Cap I think that's interesting. Yeah, capital. The yeah. The capital gain would be cheaper than the dividend tax. Yeah. If you pay out, so what you're talking about, the capital gain, when you then really liquidate your portfolio, you really sell off shares, and it's tax then. Yes. Yes. Thanks for looking it up, Jan. Hey, guys, but just on a, on a sort of, sorry, I have a button for this. So I should have pressed it earlier, but I didn't know that we will have this conversation. So, of course, the tax considerations I discussed on the slides are important. I don't want that you feel now, holy shit, this was a, a, a conversation only about tax rates. I feel now compelled to look up all kinds of tax rates in different countries. That's not what I expect uh, of you to do. I want that you understand that, of course, there are tax implications, but I don't need you to dig as deep as, as, as clearly Jan and Michael are, <laughs> are currently doing, okay? So don't freak out about it. This is an interesting side conversation. It certainly matters if you study accounting and taxation. It certainly matters if you specialize in finance on this. For a second year bachelor course, corporate finance, this goes already, I think, quite, quite deep. Okay? No need to freak out. Okay? So if dividends are taxed at a higher rate than capital gains, or depending on which country, that could be slightly different, investors should rationally prefer um, uh, price increases rather than receive actually tax dividends. The question still remains, not becomes, remains, why do firms pay dividends? And this is where I actually want to go with it. Let me just check the time. Oof, it's 54. Before we hop in, because this is what I will walk you through now, clientele effect, catering, signaling, uh, a, a scientific explanation attempts for the phenomenon, rationally we should not see dividend payments in the real world, yet we do. Why is that? So this is actually a neat way to make, have a brief break. After this, we have about 10 slides left and the mind map. So we are, we are making good progress. I suggest a 10-minute break, and then we reconvene here to wrap up. Is that all right for you guys? Perfect. I see you in 10 minutes, okay?
Guys, slowly come back to me. We start in a minute. We continue in a minute. So guys, come back to me, let's continue, let's, let's finish. <clears throat> Super, hello again, everybody back? Nice. Okay guys, like I said, on our agenda, we need to address now a little bit more what are the reasons uh, we actually do see, see dividend payments in the real world. So that is explained in the book I find quite well. Uh, I'll walk you through it. It's not a replacement for reading the book, obviously, but just to help you a little bit not lose immediately track of what's going on. Um, I have here an example, another example of homemade dividends, as I mentioned, where the investor receives dividends that are too high compared to what he or she or they want. I'll skip this for now. It's on the slides. You will see it's not complicated. If at the end of today we have time, I'll walk you through it. Otherwise, simply click through it yourself. Let's have a look. Oops, sorry. So how is dividend policy playing out in practice? Based on the view of Modigliani and Miller, based on the, uh, uh, Proposition 3, why would companies pay dividends in the real world at all? Well, originally, historically, the main idea of paying dividends was that shareholders are compensated to some degree for the risk that they take. You could say, well, they are compensated even without dividends by an increase in share price. But uh, if my, my own research goes in this, uh, in this direction, historic uh, view. We see that firms typically failed that were paying out not enough dividends. So there seems to be a connection here. So, and you can make a, a neat argument. You can say, okay, let's have a look at the dividend yield. So basically the return you earn from dividends and compare it with corporate bond yields. It's just a sort of sideshow a little bit. So this chart here shows you a comparison of the bond yield, the line sort of in white-ish, and the dividend yield here in black, in the period 1954 to 2008. So what does this mean? What, what does this diagram tell you? So this is the bond yield. The black line is the dividend yield of the S&P 500, and you see the dividend yield is far below the bonds. So there's something else you see. Here, the 80s start, the age of the best music that was ever made by our species starts here. And you see that after the 80s, the dividend yield fell even more. Why is that? What is that that we are observing here? Well, companies in the course of the 80s came to realize that dividends are not, not the most efficient way to return money to your shareholders. Buying back its own shares in the market is much, much, much smarter. Why? Taxes. And you can really see this in the diagram. So I want to stress that I'm carefully distinguishing between theories I show you because we're a university versus also real world. So everything I've told you so far checks out in the real world. Okay, summary, we have discussed this. Let's talk some more about scientific explanations aimed at why do we see dividend payments in the real world? Because we still see dividends being paid. Objectively, not the best move. So why do we see it? Explanation attempt number one, signaling. We've discussed this. Signaling is relevant and it pops up in one context typically in a situation with high information asymmetries. So you need to somehow signal that, well, what you're really thinking essentially. Uh, so what does this mean? Well, the market, meaning shareholders, investors, would infer, would think 
that the earnings situation, the future cash flows, will increase in the future simply because the company pays out dividends. It's perceived as a very credible signal. Uh, conversely, if a firm cuts dividends, a de the, the market infers a decrease in the cash flows, a decrease in the future earnings. So that's obviously a rather negative signal. The question is, could a manager of a firm increase dividends just to make the market think that the cash flows in the future will increase? So basically, can you fake it? Sometimes I say, in case you play poker, let's say Texas Hold'em, well, we can connect this to you playing Texas Hold'em. Sometimes you get a, a very good hand and obviously you want to raise, you want to tempt other players to basically bet against you, but you know you have a very good hand. So in this situation, could you, if you have a real crappy hand, could you then say you still signal to the market, so the other poker players, that your hand is actually really powerful? Yeah, you can. All in, for example. I mean, obviously people are aware that this could be a bluff, but theoretically, yes, you can in poker. Again, a situation of information asymmetry. I know exactly which hand I have, but you don't. So I could signal to you that I'm convinced that this is a winning hand by going all in. Can management do the same thing with dividends? The answer is yes, they can, but there's a huge but here. The, the strategy may seem dishonest. If you find this dishonest, then I mean, don't play poker, I think. Uh, that we actually think, we as in uh, scientists working in this field, that actually this is done quite, quite frequently in the real world. That companies raise dividends, even though you cannot really say, well, the future looks very, very good. So how does this play out then? Well, we need to discuss, would anything prevent management from this sort of fake signaling, from basically bluffing? The answer is yes. We have to discuss briefly why. Well, cash flow is, of course, capital expenditures plus dividend payments. So let's discuss a little bit how it plays out when management tries this incorrect signaling. Well, uh, there's a huge cost to raising dividends. The cash flow that you generate, you have to use for your capital expenditures, buying new assets and paying for your expenses, and the dividends that you want to pay out. So if you fake high dividend, not fake, if you increase dividends, even though you know the future is not that great, what will be the problem? So if dividends go up, your cash flow is fixed or even goes down, logically capital expenditure has to go down. So very soon the market, your investors will find out that yes, you have increased the dividends, but that now this happens at the expense of positive net present value opportunities. What is then the consequence of this? Well, once the market, the investors, realize that you have increased the dividends, even though you don't have the future cash flows, to back up a permanent dividend increase, once this information is absorbed, the share price I'm writing here should fall. In the real world, it will fall. Why? Because the market realizes that you essentially have increased dividends at the expense of positive net present value opportunities. So, that means the share price will fall, but not to the original level. It will fall further. It will decrease further. It would go down beyond the point where it would have been had dividends never been raised. So can you trick the market? Can you bluff like in poker? Yes. But I, I play poker with my friends when I go to Austria. I have a reputation for being a terrible poker player, Correct. rightly so. Because I just like playing, I don't really, I'm not doing it for the money. So I'm always all in basically, no matter how crap my hand is, I'm always all in. Yeah, when we started playing poker, it was possible to bluff my friends and they thought, damn, he constantly has good hands. But I mean, they very soon figured this out. If you constantly go all in, nobody has always a good hand, then people start to call you on that. Right? And that's exactly what happens here. So there will be a, a, a relatively swift and harsh punishment for this kind of bluffing, essentially. Let's talk about the clear tail effect. We're still, where are we on our mental map? We're still talking about what explanations do scientists come up with to explain to us why in the real world the most rational thing to do would be oh, no dividends whatsoever, only share buybacks. 
So we need to explain why do we see cash dividend payments. Clientele effect is another explanation. So we've discussed today more than I actually wanted the situation of taxes. The existence of personal taxes clearly favors a low dividend policy because the lower the dividends, the less your personal tax payments as my shareholders. Other factors, go back to, to my previous slides, favor high dividend policy. So look at the list of pros of cash dividends. After many, many years of research, no one has been able to conclude which of the two factors is more important. So the tax situation that favors a low dividend policy versus all the factors that favor a high dividend policy. We do not know exactly how these factors relate to each other. Are they equally strong? Is one of them outweighing the other? So we still don't know this. Um, so overall, scientists are rather skeptical that these factors balance each other out exactly, because why would they? Uh, so we need to dive a little bit deeper. What is the clientele effect? The clientele effect implies that the set, this set of two factors, aspects that favor a high dividend policy versus factors that favor a low dividend policy, are likely to cancel each, out, each other out after all. It's probably not fully correct, but that is what the clientele effect is, out, is, is all about. For that, unfortunately, we need to talk about taxes again. It's not super complicated though. So there are, we are now simplifying reality again a bit, but only a bit. It's, it's, not, it's not unrealistic what we're about to do. So essentially, the shareholders of a firm come in two different flavors. Individuals that, that are in high tax brackets, that simply means they already have such a high income that the tax rate that they pay, their personal tax rate, is rather high. And we have investors in very low tax brackets, so that forever, for whatever reason, pay a rather low tax rate. So what is the preference of individuals who are in a high tax bracket? So meaning that already pay a lot of taxes. Well, individuals in high tax brackets would reasonably, rationally, therefore very likely, prefer either no dividends or very low dividends because they already pay such high taxes. How is this with investors in very low tax brackets? Well, we can divide these investors into two more subgroups. So the investors that already pay very low taxes, first, could be um, just sort of normal investors in a low tax bracket. They could theoretically, conceivably prefer at least some dividends under the assumption that they prefer current income. So they want a steady stream of cash. That could occur. Secondly, and that's super relevant, in many countries, certain entities are tax exempt. They don't pay taxes, like pension funds. That's quite common. In many countries, pension funds pay no taxes on dividends or on capital gains. That's literally what a pension fund is doing as an operating activity. They do not pay uh, taxes at all because these investors are in a low tax bracket, pension funds. They face no tax consequences whatsoever. So that means pension funds likely would prefer dividends if they have a preference for current income. Okay, so what we are doing is we say, okay, there are two kinds of investors, investors that already pay a lot of taxes and investors that, that don't. We split the, the second group, the low, the low tax investors in two more groups. It's for now not that relevant. In, investors in high tax brackets prefer no dividends or very low. Investors that have very Low tax payments prefer probably high um, uh, dividend payments. Okay, and now brief thought experiment. Imagine now, this is just invented numbers, okay? Imagine that 40% of all our investors prefer high dividends. 60% prefer low dividends. This is just setting the stage. Because these investors I'm talking about, some of them are in high tax brackets, some of them are in low tax brackets, and therefore, 40% we say prefer high dividends, 60% uh, low dividends. But what is available on the market? Let's see. Again, invented numbers. Imagine that only 20% of the firms pay high dividends and 80% of the firms pay low dividends. Then this matters because there are now consequences. If 
there's clearly an imbalance between what the investors want and what is available. So high dividend firms will be in short supply. 40% of the investors want high dividends, but only 20% of the firms do that. So high dividend firms are in short supply. Low dividend firms are basically, well, in oversupply, there's too much of them. So what would happen then? Well, if the high dividend stocks are in short supply, what will happen is that people try to buy these shares of these high dividend firms. The more people buy these shares of high dividend paying firms, the higher the stock price will go, right? It's just supply and demand and vice versa. So firms that don't pay dividends, those stocks will be sold, driving down the stock price. What is the consequence? Well, we have to acknowledge that a firm does not need to have a fixed dividend policy. They can adjust. They can adjust to market preferences, of course. So in my example here, we would expect that enough low dividend firms would increase their dividend payouts so that 40% of the firms pay high dividends and 60% of the firm pay low dividends. After this adjustment in dividend policy has been done, no firm will gain from changing its investment policy anymore. And, important conclusion, once the payouts of our corporations confirm to the desires of the shareholders, high dividends or low dividends, that are the desires, no single firm can affect its market value anymore by switching from one dividend strategy to another. So what, what we discussed in the context of Modigliani-Miller Proposition 3 is not incorrect, but we, we diagnosed the firm value will not change, no matter in what form a firm pays out and how high they pay out. This does not hold in the real world because of investor preferences. Okay, That is what the clientele effect is about. Does this make sense, guys? Please interrupt me if or when I say something that's unclear. Is everyone on board, guys? If questions... Yeah? Mm -hmm. They could also like create homemade dividends, so they can be indifferent, right? No, because in the real world, homemade div dividends are less preferable over cash dividends, to the very least for transaction costs, right? Like we discussed at the, at the very beginning of today, whenever you create homemade dividends, you will in the real world incur transaction costs. In Modigliani-Miller world, perfect capital markets, one assumption is there are no transaction costs, but in the real world there are transaction costs. So in principle, you don't have an interest in creating homemade dividends because of transaction costs. Oh, okay, thank you. You're most welcome. This is it. It's not more complicated than this. Let's look at another explanation, still talking about why do we observe actual cash dividend payments in the real world. So if you are very much into finance, these two names will get burned into your retinas as you're doing the master finance, I can promise you. Baker and Wurgler, super important authors in corporate finance. They came up with an explanation about 2004, again covering why firms pay dividends. What is, the, what is their rationale? They say the ba basic premise of their theory of their work, of, called catering, is that there are times where companies are mispriced in the stock market, meaning that the price for which stocks are traded is not correct, is not the equivalent of the fundamental value, or when there are, there are times uh, when there are changes in the demand for dividend-paying equities. So basically they are saying investor demand can change for high or low dividends. They acknowledge that could be because of the clientele effect that we have just discussed. So not only does the dividend policy of a firm not need to be fixed. Also, of course, investor preferences can change. So it could be that in, in one year you say, actually, I have a, a demand, an interest, an appetite for high dividends. In a different year, it could be that you desire something else that would not be completely crazy. So what do Baker and Wurgler diagnose? They basically say, well, they could be because of the clientele effect, which predicts, of course, that a proportion of dividend-paying companies in the market increases or decreases, what's the consequence of this? The demand for dividend paying shares will shift to a new equilibrium, at least temporarily. And that means 
there are sometimes uh, some, some, some episodes, some periods where a premium will be imparted on a stock of a high or low dividend paying company or a discount on the shares of a high or low dividend paying company. Almost done. So what does catering theory then state? Well, it predicts that managers will rationally re respond to time variation in the demand of investors for high or low dividends by modifying their company's dividend policy. So I would mentally connect catering to the clientele effect. The clientele effect basically says, okay, investors have certain preferences, high dividends or low dividends, and there are firms available that pay high dividends or low dividends. But it does not need to be exactly the same amount that every investor gets exactly what he, she or they des desire. And then Baker and Würgler hop on this train and say, aha, na ja, well, if that's the case, companies actually can benefit from this by adjusting their dividend policy to changes in investor demand, investor demand for higher or low dividends, and that would benefit their share price. So in the context of, of the clientele effect, we've seen some, some uh, investors have a strong preference, let's say, for high dividend paying stocks. If there are not enough of these high dividend paying stocks available, they will, of course, drive up the price. Can you sell me your high dividend paying stock at a premium? If uh, there is uh, too much supply of, high, um, of, of higher or low dividend paying stocks, investors will sell them, driving down the price. And Baker and Würgler simply continue this thought by saying, managers, of course, know this. They will rationally, re rationally respond to that, also to changes in investor demand. And yes, they can actually increase firm value by satisfying investor demand. Investors are willing to pay more for shares that suit their needs, that suit their demands. So I find catering, Baker and Würgler, is a logical consequence of, um, uh, of uh, the clientele effect. Okay? Yeah, Baker and Würgler also showed that management behavior, at least in the US, is consistent with this theory. Like very often in science, for every uh, paper that says we found evidence that supports something, there are also plenty of papers that show that it does not hold up perfectly. So again, I have to reiterate, we are not really fully sure yet. Okay? May I ask? Of uh, course. Yes, you, you just said that the clients don't affect the, uh, the firms also adjust their dividends in the long run, right? So how is this exactly different? This is not different at all. This here, let me go back, clientele effect. So the clientele effect is that basically investors have different preferences and therefore gravitate towards the shares of firms that essentially deliver the kind of dividend policy that they want. That is, that is pretty much the clientele effect. And Baker and Würger is simply the consequence of this. It's sort of the other side. The clientele effect hyper-focuses on investor preferences, what they want and what is available in the market. Whereas uh, catering, Baker and Würgler, focuses then on the firm perspective and essentially says, how do firms react to this? So it's a logical continuation of this. They simply conclude whatever investors want, for whatever reason, clientele effect or not, irrelevant. Baker and Würgler say, well, if there are different preferences among the investors, changing your investment policy to the the, the needs, the demands of the investors can actually increase firm value because shares of companies that pay high, dividend, um, that pay high dividends might uh, be in higher demand or vice versa and therefore be traded at a premium. So Becker and Würgler is simply a continuation of the clientele effect. That's a connection. Okay. Okay. Okay, so... According to catering, Baker and Würgler, does a dividend increase lead to a positive price reaction? Unfortunately, not necessarily. It depends, of course, what the demand is, right? What is the demand? So, um, if there is a very high demand for no or low dividend paying shares, then increasing your, your dividend payouts obviously will harm your stock price. So, it depends really I would look at catering as, in simple human language, catering is about firms reacting to the demands of the market. If the, the, the majority of investors demand no dividends, 
then you could increase your market value, your firm value, by basically cutting your dividends to zero. So it depends what is the current taste, appetite, preference uh, among your shareholders. That is how you would react to it. Boom, the end of this. I would like to show you now, where is it? I would like to show you now the mind map. I have of course prepared this already. There's nothing on here that is new. I'm not fully sure that you can see this perfectly well, can you? Let me, wait, let me open it differently. This is maybe better. Just give me a second. Are you sharing the mind map separately on Candace or in accordance with the slides? Uh, I can, I can, I share it separately on Canvas. I have not done so, but I can. Give me a sec. Whoop. So, okay. So this is, as I've said, I think this covers chapter 18 very well. I want to walk you through it first. I want to show you how I've created it. Uh, yeah. And of course you can interrupt for questions. So we start here. Can you, can you read it? I mean, I read out everything anyway. Have a look at this. So we start if we are operating in a perfect capital market. What are the consequences of this? Number one, dividend policy of a firm should be relevant. Conclusion number two, investors should be or are indifferent between dividends and share repurchases. All of this would be the same. This is proposition three. Wait, I want to draw on this. Okay. Okay. So this here is proposition one, two, three. Okay. I have also done my homework. I said if perfect capital market, and I've made here sort of like a side note, perfect capital market. What does it mean? We consider a market to be perfect if there are no transaction costs, if there are no taxes. If there are a large number of buyers and sellers, so the action of no one buyer or no one seller can affect the price of a traded security. Everybody has equal access to the market. Everybody has the same information. There are no costs of financial distress. So I'm immediately, I'm using here a complicated sounding term, perfect capital market. And in order for me to actually know what I'm talking about, I immediately map it out here. That's what this means. So we say if a market is perfect, as described here, those two consequences are triggered. Dividends don't matter, investors are indifferent. That is Modigliani Miller Proposition 3. And from this, this irrelevance, we need, to, we need to basically attach our thoughts here. What does irrelevant mean? Or why is it irrelevant? Now, yeah, if dividends are larger than what we as an investor desire, we simply reinvest the excess. If dividends are less than what we desire, we simply sell some shares. These two strategies, they have a term, they are called homemade dividends. That's what homemade dividends is. Okay? Okay. But then we have to say, well, that's all beautiful, but what do we really observe in the real world? Well, certainly none of this. None of these criteria are present. Shareholders are clearly not indifferent and homemade dividends only works to a certain point. Sabine asked before, well, why do pension funds not simply generate homemade dividends? Well, because in the real world we do have transaction costs. So none of this holds. So therefore we have to ask first, what is it that we observe? What we observe is all of this. Firms in the real world, surprisingly based on Proposition 3, do not have a uniform uh, dividend policy. Based on this, we would expect that firms basically do all the same, which is no dividends. That's not what we observe. First, furthermore, we don't observe stable dividend policies. We see that firms change their policies over time. And there's more. We see positive market reactions to dividend increases. We see negative market reaction to dividend decreases. And we see many firms do pay cash dividend. So this box here shows us real-world observations. I've zoomed in here on the positive market reaction to dividend increases 
and I've zoomed in on negative market reaction to dividend decreases. And I'm going down here. And what am I saying? Positive market reaction to dividend increase, uh, sorry, to uh, dividend decreases, investors hate it. Positive market reaction to dividend increases, investors love that. So that explains their reaction. We still need to elaborate more, of course. I have here a couple of side shows now. Let me get rid of this. Okay, let me, let me show you. So we have to then discuss, based on the fact that there is no uniform dividend policy observable in the real world, based on the fact that we observe dividend change or changes in the dividend policy in the real world, we have to discuss, well, what favors high dividend policies and what favors low dividend policies. And that's what I'm doing here. So I have here a list of factors favoring a low dividend policy and a list of factors favoring a high dividend policy. Let's go through them. Fa factors favoring a low dividend policy first. Firms should not issue equity to pay dividends. We have done an example on this. Firms should not pay or reduce cash dividends, but rather do something else. What, what else should they do? They should rather increase their capital expenditures. They should rather acquire other firms. They should rather purchase financial assets. So basically they should use the money as step one in the packing order as internal sources of financing for basically making the company better, improving the future earnings, uh, following up on positive net present value opportunities, something like that. What are factors favoring a high dividend policy? Investors incur transaction costs when they engage in homemade dividends. Investors, well, this, as you can see, this is the list from the slides I showed you today. Investors with limited self-control, me, can meet their current consumption needs via high dividend equity. So via shares that pay a lot of dividends and the investor with limited self-control can avoid having to dip into the principal. So the actual portfolio itself by selling off too many shares. Managers acting on behalf of the shareholders can pay dividends to keep cash from bondholders. That's financially an advantage. That's why I told you it's not only about finance. I think this is to the very least unethical, possibly even illegal. And last but not least, a board of directors acting on behalf of the shareholders can pay a dividend to keep cash, not from only bondholders, but from spendthrift managers wasting the money on random crap that will not increase firm value. So a reduction of discretionary spending. So we are talking about, okay, we observe in the real world large differences in dividend policies. And now we look at, well, what are the pros and cons of dividends anyway? Okay. Okay. Those factors favoring a, high, a low dividend policy and a high policy, a dividend policy lead us to the clientele effect. So what we diagnose is the factors that favor a low dividend policy and factors favoring a high dividend policy likely or to the very least possibly offset each other at least to some degree. There's a bit more. This is what we've just now discussed. Some investors in high tax brackets prefer zero to low dividends. Investors in low tax brackets probably prefer low to medium dividend payments and investors that don't pay any tax, like in most countries pension funds, prefer medium to high dividends. What do we conclude? Firms with different dividend policies will arise because the audience is so mixed. So imagine I'm a teacher, let's say I, I, I uh, I simplify my student audience and I say, well, of course, my students are very diverse, but broadly speaking, I have students that love theoretic science -y stuff that want me to talk as much about nice, beautiful finance theories. And I have students that are very pragmatic that say, well, who cares about all of this? Show us only how to apply it. So if I see my audience is mixed and has different demands, obviously there will teachers will arise that offer different kinds of teaching styles. I will then maybe cater more to students that like the sciencey stuff, whereas a teacher like Celine probably will then gravitate towards teaching workshops where she can show you how to apply stuff. That's exactly what we observe here. 
not teachers with different policies or preferences arise, but firms with different dividend policies arise. How is that called? It would not be finance if we didn't have a pretty term for it. So this is the clientele effect. Okay? Okay, the clientele effect, that's where, 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 where Jan uh, jumped in. He said, well, how does this connect to catering? Well, the clientele effect logically leads us to catering. Because if we have different investor preferences, and therefore firms with different dividend policies rise, emerge, then logically we will see, well, I, I would say two different things. We will see that investors don't, who don't have a stable preference either, their taste might change as well. So there will be time variation in investor demand for dividends. That's simply complicated language for the taste, the appetite for different amounts of dividends is not stable within one investor, but could also fluctuate, change over time. And if different firms, um, uh, different firms with different dividend policies arise, they can benefit from this. Investors have different preferences, so managers will modify their dividend policy to respond to changes in investor demands. If we are in an environment where everybody prefers low dividend policy, all of a sudden, for some reason, the preference of investors change and they prefer high dividends. I, as a firm, can modify, can change my dividend policy, increase my dividend payments, satisfy your investor demand. What's in it for me as a firm? If I'm the only firm or one of the few firms that can satisfy your demand for high dividend payments, the shares of my firm will be traded as a premium. If, however, it's the opposite, uh, I'm the only firm who doesn't pay any dividends and uh, investors have a demand for high dividends, my shares, the shares of our firm, will be traded as a dis at a discount, so at a lower price. So that means managers will react to investor preferences and more. They will react to changes in investor preferences by switching, by modifying their dividend policy. Why? Because it does impact firm value. Firms that conform, that are able to satisfy investor demands in terms of dividend policy, will be traded as a, at a premium, so at a higher price. Firms that don't will be traded as a, at a discount, so at a lower price. So catering theory of, di theory of dividends predicts that there will be time variation in investor demand. We should, based on this uh, theory, observe that firms in the real world do change their policies, which is consistent with our observations that I've mapped out here. So there is at least partial to strong support for the catering theory of dividend. If you want to be completely nerdy, I would encourage you to be more extensive than me. You could also add here, who said this? Baker and Würgler, 2004. If you do a master finance and you show up on day one, knowing these things, you will absolutely crush it there. Absolutely crush it. Almost done. We have something else here. Dividend signaling. Signaling, whenever you see the word signaling, and I want that you make a note, signaling matters in situations of information asymmetry. I give you a non-finance example. Please don't be offended. There could be a situation, you're in a relationship, in a romantic relationship, and for whatever reason, your partner is distrustful. Your partner might think that you're not being faithful. Your partner might think that you're cheating on him or her. I'm not saying that's a good idea, but you could signal. Why would your partner think that? Because there are information asymmetries. Your partner will not be able to observe you 24 hours every day. So what you do all day long is kind of opaque. It's hidden. It's unobservable. So you might know that you're not cheating, but your partner might not know. So there is clear information asymmetry between you and your partner. How could you theoretically signal that you are not cheating? You could, for example, say, I tell you the PIN code of my phone. Feel free to go through my messages and emails and whatnot. On a side note, I do not think that this would be a good strategy in a relationship. You should fix the trust issue that is underlying all of this. But I would say it is a strong relatively credible signal that you are not cheating, theoretically, okay? So what is dividend signaling? Like in my example now, this matters in a situation of information asymmetry. You as a shareholder know less about the firm than I as the manager, 
but I want to signal to you the true quality of the firm. I want to signal to you what I honestly think about the future development of our earning situation. How can I signal to you credibly? So in a way, how can I as a manager give you the pin code of our company? Well, through dividend policy. So dividend signaling suggests that there is information content hidden in the dividend policy. That's complicated blah blah for if I set a high dividend policy, if I pay out or if I increase the dividend payouts, shareholders will perceive it as a positive signal about the future. If I cut the dividends, shareholders will perceive it as a negative signal about the future. And that brings us to the last concept. It's explained very well in the book. I have not addressed it in class. That's really for you to read. It's not complicated. Called dividend smoothing. What is that? It means firms let their dividends fluctuate less than their earnings. I need to elaborate very briefly. My earnings, the earnings of the firm, go up in a very good year, go down in a very bad year, so they fluctuate maybe relatively wildly. And you might now think, now okay, if the earnings of the firm fluctuate and therefore the net profit, the net, net income, if that fluctuates a lot, the company will basically pick up on this and let their dividend payouts fluctuate as wildly as the earnings. And that is exactly not what we observe. So while earnings fluctuate sometimes a lot, dividends fluctuate a lot less than the earnings. What does that tell us? It tells us that companies set their dividend policy in such a way that when they have a very, very good year, they don't pay everything out like crazy, they pay out less. If they have a very bad year, maybe a loss, they will still pay out a dividend from their past retained earnings. So that means even though the earnings might fluctuate like this, dividends fluctuate in a much, much more narrow corridor only. Okay, so this is what dividend smoothing is. And that is the whole chapter. There is not more to chapter 18 than this. So I want to show you now, uh, well, I already mentioned it in the beginning of class. So I wanted to show you this first of all, because I think it will help you a lot with the chapter itself, because there are so many terms, perfect capital markets, homemade dividends, share repurchases, catering theory, dividend signaling, dividend smoothing, high dividend policy, low dividend policy, clientele effect. I have utmost confidence when you read up on any of these terms, you, you will get it. There's no problem there. But it is not so easy, I think, to put them into, into relation to each other. But that is what true knowledge is. Not just like an encyclopedia, like Wikipedia, being able to spit out random facts. The catering theory is this. No. It's all about connecting that and putting that into a meaningful, cohesive framework. And I think that is how it's done. And I want to tell you how I created it because I'm strongly convinced that if you study like this, you will perform a lot better, you will remember this much better, and the overall output is more. So it's a more meaningful learning strategy. How did I do it? Very simple. It's really easy to create. What I did is I went through the I went to chapter 18 in the book. On a piece of paper, I simply wrote down basically the, the name of every heading in chapter 18 and every subheading. So that I simply saw, okay, that are the things that pop up. And for every heading and subheading I found, I tried to write down one or at most two sentences that capture the core message of each, no matter how small, subchapter. So I ended up actually with this but only blocks, there were no connections whatsoever, it's just the blocks. So if you read up on, let's say, catering, this is exactly the summary that you would write as well. If you look up dividend smoothing, this is exactly what you end up writing up as well. So then, just, I wrote it on a random piece of paper, handwriting, nothing fancy, and then I sat down and tried to find as many connections between the boxes as I could. There are actually many more, I just started it, you could do this much more extensively and ideally you would do this for more than one chapter. You could do something like this for every single chapter that you have to do on the exam. You could, like me, put this on a, on a PowerPoint or whatever and when you have this for every chapter, you can actually connect concepts between chapters. For example here, homemade dividend, 
you, that should, there should be a connection to, I don't know what it was, chapter 16 or something, homemade leverage, and the connection should be in bold, never confuse these concepts. Or you could, they could be connected and you say, the, sh the common denominator between homemade dividend and homemade leverage is, it leads us to diagnose that something is irrelevant because an investor can do it themselves at home in, in a way. I always distinguish between theories, theory, 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 and real life observations. In our books, that's sometimes a bit mixed. So it pays off to say what is a pure scientific prediction versus what is a real life observation. So you could color code this also a bit, as I have done. I have here in red real life observations, real life thoughts, and I have in green here everything that is essentially a theoretic prediction. Okay, so that is what I think you should be doing in order to maximize the output of the course and your, of course, exam performance. And this is how real, I think, studying should be done. Like I said, I ask, I will not ask you, I don't know, write down what is the catering theory of dividend. I mean, this, you look this up in a minute, there's no benefit to that at all. You could Google this, this is irrelevant. I would more ask you about connections. Explain the connection between clientele effect and catering theory. I don't care that you explain this to me or this. I want that you point out what's the connection. Or I could say something like, why does dividend signaling matter? Because of information asymmetries. So either way, no matter what we discuss, we could actually with our finger point it out here on this map. Okay? So I think the way you should, in my view, you should, but certainly how you could approach the whole subject, the whole course. There are so many of you, divide up the chapters, work on it, on each chapter in the way I described. Simply start by writing down every subheading of one chapter. Then for every subheading, read the text and try, not copy-paste. I didn't copy-paste either. I tried to really in my own words, in the simplest way possible, express what is this paragraph, this small subchapter really about? Write it down. And then find the connections, circulate it, proofread it, be critical. Don't have this mindset, yeah, I got this now from a friend and obviously as a good friend, I have to say, no, good job. No, be critical. If there's something not okay about this, then point it out. You forgot this. I think you should add, add this here, whatever. So be critical until you have something like this for every chapter. And ideally, one thing with all mind maps together, with all connections there. Last thing I'm going to say for today, if you do this, if I see at the end of the course a mind map or mind maps for the chapters, and you send it to me, I'm happy to review it and give you a little bit of feedback on it. The work has to come from you. I'm happy to put in some extra work as well and review it, give you feedback, give you ideas for improvement. But that is how I think it should be done. Whew. Guys, any questions? Anything I can do for you? I have a question. Can Bring it, Alice. I can hear you. Hi. Uh, it's a question about proposition, um, Marilyn Miller proposition one without taxes. That's, I mean, you're in a completely wrong movie right now, Alice, I have to say. Please bring your question, but it's completely off topic. But bring it. Uh, yeah, I know, I know. It's completely off topic. Yeah. Go. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't understand an implication. So why do work is equal to the cost of equity in a non-levered firm? I don't understand why. Okay, that's, I, 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 I want to answer your question, but that is something that really, please send it in our Telegram group, then I will re review it. I feel this is a, such a structural break in this conversation that, that I also I, have to, I would have to think about it. I'm, I'm, please send it in the group, I will for sure respond, okay? Guys, anything? Let me check the YouTube. Yes, sir. I wanted to ask you another question more on what we just discussed. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Alberto. Bring it. Yeah. Yeah. Could, could you show the, the, the last slide you were just, the mind map you were just? On? Yes. Yes. So, from what I understood, both in the uh, dividend signaling and in the catering theory of dividends, we use an increase or decrease in dividend payouts. Correct. Yeah. What I don't understand, what I, what I would like to ask you maybe to expand a bit upon is 
how in the real world do investors differentiate between, uh, uh, for example, a payout, uh, a dividend decrease that would perhaps it could be signaling that it's a, it's, it's going to be a tough future for the company mm -hmm. against uh, a dividend decrease that would be just to match the, the new preferences, for example, of more uh, investors which are in high tax uh, brackets and they yeah. prefer this low dividend. Uh... It's an excellent question, Alberto. This goes this is really going very, very deep now. So that's that's let me let me let me let me just to be just to be super crystal clear. I, I'm happy to respond, but I just want to want to be clear, okay? So how, how does this play out in the real world? What Alberto described is a situation as follows. I want to repeat for also for, for viewers on YouTube. There are Basically, Alberto, and please correct me if I'm grossly misrepresenting your question, but Alberto essentially says there are two kinds of reasons or two kinds of dividend decreases. It could be, number one, a company simply decreases uh, their dividend payments. Then Alberto says, now nah, wait a second, in the, in the framework through the lens of dividend signaling, this would be a negative signal. If I look at this situation through the lens of dividend signaling, then the market reaction should be very, very negative. And then Alberto says, but dividends can also be, uh, can decrease for another reason, Baker and Würgler catering. Alberto said, well, sometimes there are situations where there is a high investor demand for low dividend paying shares, yet there might be only firms on the market that pay a lot of dividends. Based on Baker and Würgler's work, 2004, catering, these firms can actually then increase their market value by decreasing their dividend payouts. That's what it's about. So Alberto concludes with a question, how does the market basically distinguish between this? Through the lens of signaling, a reduction in dividend payouts is a negative signal. Signaling uh, negative outlook on the future earnings situation. In the, through the lens of Baker, Baker and Würgler, this could simply be adjusting to an investor demand for low dividend paying stocks, which would then actually cause a positive reaction. So Alberto, 100% correct. I love it. It's very insightful. If you do a master finance, you might want to make a note on this. Okay, super cool. Yeah, that's awesome. If you do some, if you do the master finance, this could be a, a meaningful starting point for a master thesis, honestly, to try to distinguish between this. So I would uh, respond by saying it depends on the context. So if you were to do a large-scale econometric study studying 100 years of dividend policy, the, the data would be sort of mixed up and you would end up, I think, with mixed results. So uh, it would look kind of kind of mixed, probably the way to, to, to address this is to figure out for each company what were investor sentiments at that time. So there are different, that goes way too far for today, but there are different metrics, different variables that can capture the mood of investors, the preference of investors that would uh, yield some insights here. In principle, you're right. Uh, I would that's the last thing I want to say about it. I would at this point say the following thing. I would add simply one word here to signaling. I would say, we said, if a company decreases their dividend payouts, it is perceived as a negative signal. I would clarify now by saying, typically, typically a decrease in dividend payouts yields or leads to a negative market reaction. Stock price goes down because it signals negative outlook for the future. But only typically, if we are in an environment where investor demand simply requires no or low dividend payments, a reduction in dividends would be a logical reaction. So you could say that catering theory is a bit of a, a special case of dividend signaling. Okay, So there would be a connection here as well. But like I said, this is very advanced. And uh, in order to capture that research-wise, not only you, I would also have to sit down and do some serious thinking. One of my co-authors, Alberto, I want to maybe end on this, is an expert on dividend policy in the historic context. He wrote a paper on, uh, I think, dividend policy covering 100 years in the Netherlands. 
Uh, I happily, first of all, send you the paper. And if you do the master and later on want to do dividends, something on, for your master thesis, I would love to bring you in contact and you guys can chat or we can have a meeting, the three of us. Okay? Super, guys. Super. I'm very happy. I think uh, we are doing really well in terms of time. We are, we are a little bit ahead of where we should be. As far as I'm concerned, all is going well. Um, so, yeah, uh, no need to panic. Please go to Celine's workshop on Friday. Uh, and please keep me in the loop if something is not going all right. That can be finance related, but that can be also in general study related, okay? It's no need to sit at home freaking out about stuff. You can always share this with me and I, I know many people at RSM. I'm in touch with all kinds of other committees and so on. The worst case is that I cannot directly help you with whatever issue you have. But to the very least, I want to know about it so that you at least give me the chance to help if something goes wrong, okay? Don't forget this. Guys, have a great day. Thanks for joining me at this ungodly hour. Really good job. And I'll see you next week. I think it's probably Monday in usual awesomeness. See you guys.